Hey guys, welcome to this little bottom of the garden retreat, as it were, the Holy Shed, which by the way, somebody told me rather wonderfully recently has become for them a kind of metaphor for a space that they've discovered now in their own mind where they can think what they like, doubt what they like, explore wherever they like and just not feel screwed over by people saying these are things that you have to believe. A little holy shed that they carry around with them. Perfect. I say that is just what I believe the holy shed is all about. So whatever's going on with you right now, happy or sad, struggling or flying high, you're among friends. Step inside, grab a seat, you're welcome. And as it happens, the sun is still shining outside here anyway, which I always find helps, don't you? So looky here, we are done, done with atonement for now, kind of. <laughs> Today, we're going in a different direction. And we're, for this session, going to look at some art. Hurrah! Uh, but salvation, at one moment, will kind of pop up. But it's art, and that's just great, isn't it? You remember I mentioned last week that uh, we'd just been to hear the folk blues singer Eric Bibb in concert near King's Cross and had a wonderful time. Um, indeed, I finished last time in the shed with a little video of him singing the spiritual I Want Jesus to Walk With Me, which actually was the first song I ever heard a recording of Eric Bibb singing, and it's always actually been my favourite song. He's from New York originally, I believe, but he has lived around the place and he's lived for many years now in Stockholm in Sweden, where he is married to Ulrika, a singer in her own right. And she performed with him on a couple of songs that we at the gig we went to. And uh, that was great to, to see her involved as well. I love Eric. Um, from the moment I first heard him sing, I've loved Eric. Basically because, apart from just the most gorgeous voice, he's got soul. And I don't mean, you know, the musical style of, of soul, but I mean as a person. He's a man of soul, of a big soul, actually. He sings from somewhere deep down within about issues that he really cares about. And a lot about issues of race and social justice, but also a love for God, a love for the world, a love for the universe, which is, I find, very, very positive, very uplifting. He said a lot of things in between songs at the gig we went to, which I really enjoyed and appreciated. But I was especially intrigued by what he said about the inspiration for the title of his most recent album. It's just come out, actually, and the cover picture uh, of that album. It's called Riding Without a G. And uh, he said that the inspiration for this came from a painting by an American artist called uh, Eastman Johnson, who was born in 1824 and died 81 years later in 1906. Great name, isn't it? Eastman Johnson. Eastman was an interesting guy himself who grew up in a well-off family in Maine, in on the east coast of the United States. His father was uh, a businessman and later became uh, Secretary of State for Maine. In his mid-twenties, Eastman moved to The Hague to study art. He wanted to study art more, and uh, he got embroiled in uh, the whole hubbub of, of uh, European art that, was, that he found was going on. And he became a particular fan of Rembrandt, and actually... He's, he's now known as America's Rembrandt because um, certainly in form, quite a number of his paintings are Rembrandt-esque. He was also a passionate opponent of slavery. And this is where the connection with Eric Bibb and his concert comes in because uh, the artist painted many pictures of Negroes, African-Americans as we now call them, and um, and he always pictured them in a positive light, which wasn't the obvious way to success or recognition as an artist in his world at the time. The painting which Eric Bibb 
found so inspiring is this one, and it's called A Ride for Liberty, The Fugitive Slaves. Take a moment. Isn't that just wonderful? I think it's an amazing picture for many reasons. It portrays a scene which Eastman Johnson says he actually witnessed during a battle in the Civil War uh, on March the 2nd, 1862, just days as it goes before the Confederate stronghold, I think it was in Virginia, uh, was uh, ceded to Union forces. And as you can see, it's a formerly enslaved family charging and I, I love the way the, the the whole picture is charging forward for liberty for the safety of union lines and it's portrayed in the dull light of dawn and you can see over to the left in in the mist of the early morning light the bayonets of the union troops just glittering in the early light and the thing is as I say, there's a lot of remarkable things about this, but it's the absence of white figures in this liberation image that makes it virtually unique in American art of that period. These African Americans are independent agents of their own freedom. That's the thing. They're not being saved. They're saving themselves. Father, mother, a little child, little boy, I think, in front of his dad and an infant in the arms of mum at the back of the horse. It depicts the family between these two places, these two sides, slave life on the plantation behind them and the possibility of freedom up ahead. Unlike many paintings that showed slaves as childlike um, or bestial characters, these are strong human figures grasping their own destiny, not being liberated, as I say, by others, but liberating themselves, as indeed many others like them did at the time. Mostly, slaves, when they were included in a picture, were situated at the periphery somewhere, you know, and servile. But here, they are the image, they are the subject, not objects, of this painting. It's all about them. And notice the father's focused vision, which is straight ahead in a courageous focus on the future. The mother is glancing back at what they leave behind, perhaps nervous about being pursued, though I doubt that that would happen since they're riding into the Union line. But she's glancing back. The young boy looks down, excitedly, I think, at the powerful horse, the awesome creature which is carrying them at great speed to freedom. There's so much to love about this picture. Eastman Johnson was also a big fan of Jean Francis Millet, who I have talked about in the shed in the past. And um, this wonderful painting, which I've showed you in the past, of the Holy Family's flight into Egypt, you know, surely has resonances with Johnson's picture. I, I love this image dearly. And it doesn't have that energetic force of uh, Johnson's picture, but it's a, it's, it's a portrayal of going through the gloom, passing out of the gloom toward a place of light. And the only real light in the picture, actually, is the light which is not shining on, but emanating from the child in Mary's arms. And, you know, thinking about the uh, the previous picture I've just showed you. There's a poet uh, from the same era called Francis Ellen Watkins Harper. Lovely face, hey? And she, she as I say, was a poet from the same era, but unlike the uh, the slaves fleeing that we see in the painting, 
she was a freeborn African American from Baltimore, Maryland, and she dedicated her en entire life to social causes, including abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, and you know the whole quest for equality. She was a passionate woman, uh, an incredible orator, apparently who would go on a circuit, speaking uh, in favour of of abolition. And there are some lines from one of her poems that I, I stumbled on that I think are so beautiful and harmonise with, with, uh, with the painting here. I think I could put them on screen. In agony, close to her bosom, she pressed the life of her heart, the child of her breast. Oh, love, from its tenderness, gathering might, had strengthened her soul for the dangers of flight. But she's free, yes, free from the land where the slave, from the hand of oppression, must rest in the grave, where bondage and torture were scourges and chains, have placed on our banner indelible stains. There's another painting uh, by Eastman Johnson that I want to show you. And this one's called The Lord is My Shepherd. And again, we have an African-American front and center, a beautiful figure of a man reading the Bible. And this was painted a little later than Ride for Liberty, after the war had been completed, after Lincoln's emancipation had been proclaimed. And it shows presumably a former slave sitting, as you might see, against a blue jacket, which very much looks like a jacket from the Union Army, as if to indicate that he served in the army fighting against the Confederates. Perhaps the most remarkable political aspect of this painting is the very action that it portrays a black person, reading. Slave literacy was illegal in many parts of the South. Very few could read. But this is a freed man, once again taking his destiny into his own hands. Literacy was essential to become contributors to society. Not long after the war, Harper's Weekly uh, declared the alphabet is an abolitionist. It's a great statement, isn't it? The alphabet is an abolitionist. If you would keep a people enslaved, refuse to teach them to read. I think that's something that the Taliban appear to be aware of in their persistent blocking of education to girls and women. The way to keep people enslaved is don't allow them to read. So that's so it's an act of emancipation that we are viewing here. And and here's the interesting thing. The title of the painting is The Lord is My Shepherd, which is, you know, an affirmation that would be very important to former slaves still faced with dangerous and difficult times ahead. And to know passing through the dark valley, the Lord is with you is a very powerful statement of affirmation. And yet, and here's the interesting thing, the Bible clearly is not open at the book of Psalms, which is, I'm sure you know, dead centre in the Bible. The man is reading something much earlier. Probably, it's assumed, the book of Exodus, about the liberation of the Hebrew slaves from Pharaoh. I think that's, I think that's the case. That's how it speaks to me. Eastman Johnson was deliberate in his work all the time. Whatever he did, nothing was there, you know, by chance. The, the choice of where the book is open is not haphazard. And he would certainly have known his Bible well enough to know where the Psalms was. The man's reading the story of freedom from oppression, still a dangerous point at that particular time. Maybe still a dangerous point in a different way in our own world. And I'd like to link this back to the subject 
of atonement. Excuse me, I'm here. Uh, I'd like to link it back to the subject of atonement and salvation in particular, which we have been thinking about. Because Marcus Borg makes the point, I've already talked and discussed in the shed, that salvation is a word uh, with, with extraordinarily rich uh, meaning to it. The devastating consequence of making the afterlife the main focus of religion, of faith, salvation, is that salvation then ceases effectively to be a here and now thing other than making the decision. To, to follow Jesus or whatever and <clears throat> the focus shifts instead to being something simply about heaven and hell who's in and who's not in when it has so much you know greater and wider application in scripture than talking about the afterlife the Latin root of the word salvation lies in healing and wholeness that's that's salvation is really about healing and wholeness biblical meanings of salvation uh, include all kinds of things they include uh, liberation from bondage they include homecoming or return from exile uh, life instead of death sight to the blind healing of the wounds of existence and, and a whole pile of other things too uh, as I say, the theme runs through the entire Bible. Salvation as liberation from bondage comes straight out of that story uh, of the Exodus that it would seem that that man is reading in the picture. Um, and this is, the Exodus story is, is the most formative event in ancient, history, ancient Israel's history. But it's also resonated powerfully with African-American slaves, like the man in the picture. And indeed, with all kinds of liberation causes and movements in the world today. You know, we have this thing uh, called liberation theology, which actually, you know, is specifically directed at issues of economic injustice and so on. But really, liberation theology has fanned out into a, and given birth to a whole bunch of other sort of liberation theologies uh, all kinds of movements for wholeness freedom and inclusion i mean things like feminist theology is a form of liberation theology uh, lgbt plus or queer theology as as people sometimes call it ethnic theologies about race and so on even climate theology you know the liberation of creation all of these things follow the same model of liberation theology that's rooted in the narrative of the Exodus story. Uh, that's where they all come from. Uh, as does, ironically, I think, the human rights of Palestinians today struggling uh, in the face of the apartheid policies of, uh, of a right-wing Israeli government. Movements toward the liberation are all part of what the biblical what biblical salvation points to and indicates and then probably the other great you know event in the history of the hebrew people in what we call the old testament that shaped the jewish bible was the experience of exile in babylon and that story of exile creates an understanding of salvation as return of reconnection of homecoming and also scattered throughout the Bible, you've got images of salvation uh, as having one's eyes opened. Jesus talks about this. There are other forms of salvation too. In Psalms, salvation is primarily about deliverance from our enemies or deliverance from serious illness or from you know, other similar threats to that. The idea of salvation as just an afterlife, this sort of heaven and hell framework, doesn't really appear at all in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures. It means true that the New Testament salvation does sometimes point toward an afterlife, but most of the time, especially through Jesus in the Gospels, the word salvation has meaning connected to forms of liberation in this life, in the here and now. Liberation from greed, from fear and anxiety, from small-mindedness, and healing from the wounds of just existing 
in this world. Salvation is a huge umbrella, all basically clustered around the themes of healing and wholeness and liberation and a sense of coming home. A big salvation theme in the ministry of Jesus is released from fear. You know how many times you hear Jesus saying, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. It was a mantra that he repeated over and over again, even when fear wasn't the issue that was apparently at stake. But Jesus saw the underlying malady of so many people to be fear. And I think that's no different today. And and sometimes it puzzles me how many Christians who whose hope is to go to heaven when they die, live here and now with all kinds of fear and anxiety. I mean, I think, you know, we need to please stop worrying about where we'll spend eternity, which is surely God's business, if anyone's, and just start to enjoy salvation, wholeness and healing and liberty in the here and now. I've made it clear in my books uh, that I'm not at all denying an afterlife. I have my own wonderful hopes about that. But Christian faith, as I often say, is distorted when we make the afterlife the sole or the most central purpose of what Christianity is about. Uh, you know, I, I'm just personally far too busy focusing on enjoying salvation and living in wholeness in this life and pursuing that for myself and for other people to be bothered about something that I know virtually nothing about and can happily live, live to God and to the future, right? So let me bring you back to that wonderful image, A Ride for Liberty, and ask how this speaks to you today. I don't know if I can just find it again. Spend a moment looking at it. Um, and ask, how does this speak to me today uh, in my own life or in our world in what way are we or do we need to be riding for liberty for ourselves and others who are the people in our world who are in all sorts of desperate ways trying to ride for freedom I mean, just check out the focus of the Father. His focus is on a hopeful future. On the, check out the entire beautiful energy of the painting. That driven forward motion of leaving the past behind and moving forward. Maybe someone is chasing them. Maybe shots are being fired over their heads. Maybe one could strike them. Maybe. Maybe, but maybe can so easily become the language of fear. What if, what if, what if? Do you remember the serenity prayer that I formulated and offered during lockdown about things that we can't control because, my God, that was, the pandemic was something we could not control, wasn't it? It was going on all over the world. It's gone all around about us and the fear that was generated and all we could do as we constantly were told, was stay at home. Well, I think the family on their horse are changing what they can, and that's the focus of the prayer that I wrote, and that's, I think, where our focus needs to be. So I wonder if you might fancy saying it with me. God grant me the serenity to live fully and generously, through circumstances I cannot control. Hope to keep on imagining better times for myself and the world, and courage to change what I can instead of simply leaving it to others. Amen. So here's another prayer. Well, it's, it's more of a toast, really. Take this as our toast this week. Thank you, loving God, for the wonder of hope and resilience which summer sunshine brings to our soul. Thank you for every little sign which you offer each day if we look for them, 
magnificent fragile flowers in city streets and parks for the colour of our diverse cultures and backgrounds for the sunshine smiles of strangers as well as friends holy loving god mystery of the universe who cannot ever be named heaven and earth are filled with your goodness Save us, we pray, from small minds and mean spirits, and fill us instead with passion for kindness and justice. And so we toast the glorious beauty of life, mindful of the spirit of Jesus at work in our lives, in the ordinary and the everyday, in our desire to love as generously as he loved. So, each time we eat and drink, May we proclaim his death and resurrection, reenacted in our world a million times each day in magnificent and routine demonstrations of love. To Christ's love and life and joy. L'chaim. Well, I hope you've enjoyed looking at those pictures. I know I, I love them. And, um, and I think now we should just pull all that together with a toast to life and freedom to possibility to leaving the past behind to stepping out of our fears and moving forward into uncertainty but doing that with faith to the rich diversity that life and the world presents us with to friends and family and people to travel with to life Lachaim. marvelous okay well you know if you like what i'm doing here in the shed guess what you can buy me a coffee you can follow the link which is on the screen now it's also always at the top of the holy shed facebook posts and we are deeply grateful to all of you who support us in this way and lots of other ways too uh thank you thank you thank you and um some of you may know that I have been a speaker at Greenbelt off and on for years and years now, the Greenbelt Festival. I'm a big supporter of Greenbelt. I'm a trustee of Greenbelt at the moment. And guess what? I'm going to be giving a talk at this year's Greenbelt. So I do encourage you to come. It's the 50th anniversary of the festival this year. 50, 50 blinking years. I didn't go right at the beginning. I went in 1978 was the first one. I ever intended so still a little bit of a veteran uh, but this year's 50th and that's wonderful and one of the things that the festival have done is they've commissioned 50 people connected with the festival past and present to write a short essay on one of 50 words that kind of are connected with the festival uh, I've done one and lots of other people have too and so i just want to show you this little film clip about it because basically what uh it's going to be a really plush book you know um a kind of a real kind of coffee table cup book and something that you want to come back to again and again uh it's costing quite a lot to produce it's as i say it's it's it, it, the intention is that it's a a really substantial plush book so it's being funded by by crowdfunding so if you'd like to contribute to that you can do so and here's a little video about that which you might enjoy The place where faith, arts and justice meet will by its nature be political, concerned with bringing about change, committed to making a difference, holding up a mirror to the powers that be. As Chinese artist and activist Ai Weiwei has famously said, everything is art, everything is politics, nothing escapes the realms of the political. This is why those that disproportionately hold power for themselves fear the change 
when people are shaken out of the slumber of inaction because of music and poetry and dance. As Walter Brueggemann writes in The Prophetic Imagination, every totalitarian regime is frightened of the artist. It is the vocation of the prophet to keep alive the ministry of imagination. Hey, there you go. So that's the uh, the link if you want to check out uh, about crowdfunding. Um, I think you can give, you know, just a very little bit or, or more, um, depending. But really what I'd like to say is, if you've never been to Greenbelt, this is a very good year to go there. Not least because I'm speaking, but uh, but because it's always a great event. And, and this year is going to be a particularly celebratory one. Um, hey, I don't camp, by the way. We, we, we camped for years, but, you know, we're done with camping. So uh, we, we usually go to some some bed and breakfast or whatever nearby. and um, Or you can visit just for the day. Um, it's, it's, it's really something, if you haven't been, you should consider. If you haven't been for a long time, this would be a good year to come back again. And there it is. I think there's one other parish notice I want to say, which is, um, oh gosh, I haven't got it here, but I will. I'll show it you next week. Um, we now have a German translation of Black Sheep and Prodigals, and I love it. It's a really beautifully done, and uh, it's now available on Amazon. So if you know anybody in the German speaking world, I'd really love you to help me get that the message out to the German speaking world. And uh, I hope that maybe I'll get the chance to go and do some book launches in some German speaking countries. And if you've got any ideas about that, you can make suggestions or make contacts for me. I'd be very, very much appreciative of that. And there we are. I'm going to finish with a video of Eric Bibb. Why not? Um, with a wonderful uh, musician from, I think he's from Senegal. I'm not sure. I think he's from Senegal playing an amazing instrument that I've never seen the like of before, singing I Shall Not Be Moved. And it's it's great. And actually, I think Ulrika joins in on some of the, the singing too, though she's not part of, you know, visually part of the, the video. So there you go, guys. Have a great week. Uh, I hope it, well, it looks like for those of us here in this country anyway, definitely in the southern part of the United Kingdom, there's a lot of sun this week. So, um, but whether it's raining or sunning, sun shining or whatever, have a good time and, and, you know, just share some love with people round about. Be kind to people. Be kind to yourselves. Be kind to this wonderful planet that God has given us as a home. Stay human. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. And we'll think of something else to talk about in the shed when I've caught my breath. All right, then? Here you go.